So it looks like we're, uh, what, one or two after here, so I think we can get started. So today we have a uh, special guest with us, uh, Dr. Uh, Rex Marco. And uh, as a way of introduction, uh, I, I just want to tell one quick story about Dr. Marco, and then I'm going to let him uh, uh, take over and, and speak to us. And so um, I obviously have a great interest in uh, spinal tumors uh, and uh, uh, early on in residency, when I was discussing that, my mentors uh, immediately started talking about uh, uh, Dr. Marco and him being one of the leaders in the field, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that continued throughout my career. And as a fellow, I was I presented at Banff on uh, radiation uh, <clears throat> exposure in the operating room, and I was making the case that if you, you know, do things a certain way and spin an O-arm to check your hardware then you know, the radiation's really minimized to, to everybody involved. And in the poster session later, uh, someone came up to me, uh, uh, incredibly thoughtful uh, and kind and said, well, great talk. Um, you know, one thing you could consider is in children that might be a little different because you know, doing an O-arm's not, you know, that's a little bit, that's a, a good amount of radiation. And, um, and there'd be, <laughs> And I just remember they, they, they were being so thoughtful about it. And I turned around and started talking to that person and having not met him before, but heard about him for several years now, I said, oh my gosh, that's Rex Marco talking to me. And I remember that conversation was meant so much to me as a fellow, because so often as a, as a fellow and in training, you know, you're, you're kind of talked down to, or you're, or you're kind of told the way things are. And this, this guy who I looked up to all of my training is talking to me and being just so respectful and so thoughtful, uh, kind of the opposite of what you get most of your training. And, and it was, and it was Rex, it was my introduction to, to Dr. Marco. Um, that, uh, that being said, even this year with one of my fellows, we were, uh, uh, talking about Dr. Marco and, and he, uh, trained in Houston. He said, you know, Dr. Marco is known around the area, um, for his patient care and, and for being thoughtful uh, and for, for doing what it takes to do the right thing and, and take the best care of the patient. So I will let uh, Dr. Marco tell his story, uh, but I wanna certainly uh, uh, thank him for coming today uh, and being a part of this. And it certainly is a real honor for me and a real honor for this uh, group to, to have you here. So I'll let him uh, take over from here. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that really nice introduction. and this invitation for me to speak today. Uh, what I'll be talking to you about is entitled From Surgeon to Patient and Back Again. And I'll start with my journey and some tools for recovery that I learned over the years, as well as some lessons learned, including medical lessons, advocating lessons, a bit about ableism and a research update. And so I identified as a surgeon, a coach, and someone in recovery for my own codependency issues, as well as issues regarding my kids' substance use. And through my recovery, I started mountain biking, and it was on a trail that I was on and the rest of the group went right, much like depicted in this picture. And I looked up and I saw a branch on the ground. So I wanted to go left, which is a smoother trail from what I thought. But at the bottom of this trail, there was a divot and my tire hit that divot. And the next thing I knew is I heard a crack. And I wasn't sure what that crack meant. I thought it could be my helmet or my head or my neck. And so as I was thinking about that, I knew that I could sit there and use the tools that I learned about breathing and breathe and understand that no matter what happened, no matter what that crack was, I could radically accept whatever the outcome was. And I could ask for 
serenity to accept the things that I could not change, like that turn that I decided to make or that crack that I heard. And I could also ask for courage to change the things that I could change, like reduce my neck if it was broken. And I had heard stories of of surgeons doing that on the on the ski slope before and also the wisdom to know the difference between the things I could change and the things that I couldn't. Within a few minutes, I heard my friend run up to me and there was panic in his voice and I asked him to touch my leg and he said that he was. And I asked him if I was moving my foot and I was trying and he said that he could, I wasn't moving my foot. And then I asked him if I was moving my hands or I asked him to touch my hands and he said that he was. And at that point, I knew that that crack was my neck and that I was paralyzed. And because I couldn't feel or move, I knew that there was less than 5% chance that I would ever walk again. And I knew that I would probably never hold my unborn child or coach or operate. Those things were very unlikely. I also knew this data that the likelihood of me getting improvement was much higher if I was decompressed as early as possible. Within 24 hours is what this study showed. And, and so soon the EMS arrived and they were following protocol. And I knew that protocol wasn't going to help me there because I heard my friend slipping and tiring and they wanted to go down underneath and try to get a collar on me and check my vitals. And that I knew was not going to be possible in the precarious position that I was in. So I looked at my other friends and, and said that you need to get me up. And they gently guided me up onto the trail. And I taught the young ladies that were there how to hold me, hold my neck in line and keep me as protected as possible. And, and then I was able to get onto the stretcher. What occurred to me then though was that I needed to get off of that backboard. The instant I got on it and what happened and why I thought that I believe is can be gleaned from this book called Trauma Stewardship where the author talks about the trauma that we incur when we take care of patients. And Three of these pictures uh, represent things that I had taken care of during my career. Uh, patients that were all C4 quads, which is what I am. And the first one is someone that had a spit fistula. And that vision of my patient with a Penrose drain sticking out of his neck and his saliva draining from that Penrose drain to help him control his saliva was vivid in my mind. And this pressure ulcer is representative of a pressure ulcer I saw in a patient who was a 
C4 quadriplegic in Haiti, who was six weeks out from the earthquake. And he was lying there with this gigantic pressure wound. And then the image on the right is a patient who was a C4 quadriplegic and that's his sacral pressure sore where the gauze is. And before we started the operation, we did a cystoscopy and we could see the gauze, the sacral gauze through the cystoscope. And I also knew that Christopher Reeve died of complications from a pressure sore. And so the instant I got on that backboard, I wanted to get off. And I knew I needed to get off. And this is the operation that we ended up doing for that patient who had that huge pressure sore and osteomyelitis of the pelvis and sacrum. In the trauma bay, when they did the rectal examination, I thought I could feel something. So in my mind, I was then in Asia B and had a much better prognosis. My surgeon felt that because I couldn't definitely feel that I was in Asia A, but my physiatrist said that he believes if we think we can feel, then he upgrades us to an Asia B. He ended up being right uh, because I did start to gain some reason, some sensation over time and have some flickering of some of my muscles. But as soon as the CT scan was done, I asked him to get me off of the backboard. And my surgeon knew that I tended to want to give intermediate dose steroids to my patients with a traumatic spinal cord injury, uh, mainly from my experience with uh, tumors because there's some data to suggest that intermediate dose steroids, not high dose steroids are beneficial in that setting. And so 10 milligrams loading of Decadron followed by 6Q6 was what I asked for and he gave me. And then he showed me my films and I was really encouraged when I saw this slight sl subluxation and perched facets. And so I thought that, oh, they'll just reduce me here in the ER and things will be better. And then he showed me this and I realized that this is where I lay, not what the deformity was and the compression was uh, at the time of the injury. So I was less optimistic after seeing this fragment of bone still in the canal. But within two and a half hours of my injury, I was in the operating room. And I think that's a miracle and in large part due to Dr. Failing's work where he has pushed centers and surgeons and EMS to get people decompressed as soon as possible. And decompressed in that landmark paper meant a halo decompression with traction was some was considered a decompression. So it didn't mean that someone had to go to the operating room, but it did mean that they were at least decompressed in the emergency room, if not in the operating room. And there's also good data to suggest that the, keeping the maps around the 85 millimeters per mercury range is beneficial for neurologic recovery. I had always thought that 80 millimeters of mercury was my goal, but I've subsequently learned that it's that 85 may be the better goal to shoot for.
And then the discussion of a pre-op MRI, I rarely obtain those in my patients with traumatic spinal cord injury. My surgeon routinely obtains them. And both of us decided that we would just go to surgery and that the MRI would not be beneficial in this case. When I got to the ICU, I continuously used my tools for recovery. And one of the biggest tools that I used was this little app called Stop, Breathe, and Think. And it's still called that for the adolescents and young children. And for adults now, it's called My Life. But stopping and breathing and thinking and checking in with this app helped me learn so much about living in the present moment and being more mindful instead of having my mind full of thoughts of the past or future fears. And in that way, I could stay present and live in this moment. And it also helped me develop a mindfulness tool where I could be present with my senses. And if you're open to it, I'll invite you to close your eyes or have a slightly downward gaze and take a few deep breaths. And on your next breath in, smell. And on your next breath out, taste. And on your next breath in, listen. And on your next breath out, feel. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back to the room. And that short mindfulness exercise is something that I would do before I went into the OR or in the middle of a case when I felt that the patient was in danger. And in the ICU, I use that all the time. And even though the ventilator was breathing for me, with every breath in, I could smell. And with every breath out, I could taste. And with every breath in, I could listen and with every breath out, I could try to feel whatever feelings I had. And step three of the 12 step program I was, I'm working taught me that I could ask to be relieved of my issues of self especially things like self-pity and self-righteousness. And this helped me with my caregivers and with my recovery. So as I wouldn't feel self-pity, it would give me a daily reprieve from self-pity, which is really easy to feel. And I know it's okay to feel. I also know it didn't serve me well. And something that I started doing a couple weeks before my accident was this Panda Planner. And I'm not much of a planner, but this planner was different. It was very succinct. 
and it told me to do think five things to start my day. And one was make a list of three things I'm grateful for, three things I'm excited for, a daily affirmation, a daily focus, and a daily exercise plan. And each day, two of the three, three things that I was grateful for included breath from this ventilator and life. And the three things I was excited for is I was excited to see my caregivers and my family and my doctors and friends. And my daily focus was always to be present in this moment. And my daily affirmation was always and still is, I am enough. I also started every day with a loving kindness practice where I would say, May I be kind and compassionate, humble and accepting, honest and accountable, committed and forgiving. And may I love kindly and kindly love. And I was really thankful that there was a healing channel that played beautiful images of nature and instrumental music, which was really calming. And at nighttime, I couldn't sleep. So I would have the nurses play the surrender meditation by Jason Stevenson, and that helped me. And all of these tools for recovery helped me find moments of peace and love and happiness during a very difficult and trying time. I also had images of Christopher Reeve. Here he's pictured at the Oscars. And I remember this. He was so inspiring. He was Superman to me, uh, one of the early uh, figures to play Superman. And what he did uh, was so courageous and inspiring uh, to me. And I knew that I didn't know what the entire plan was for me, but I knew that part of it would be to increase awareness around spinal cord injury and raise money for research and hopefully show people the benefits of mindfulness. Going over some of the lessons that I learned, looking at the critically ill system approach that I learned as a medical student, breaking up all of the components of patient care into different systems, I think is really important. And some of the things that I learned were about mouth care and the respiratory therapist would always perform really good oral hygiene. And I learned that there's data to show that there's decreased likelihood of developing pneumonia if you have good mouth care, which makes sense to me now, but I had never learned that before. Keeping the head of the bed up uh, 30 degrees decreases pneumonia risks as well. I had C2 through four spinal cord edema, and that was a pulmonary concern uh, for me and keeping my maps up, using my gut to tube feed me. And I know many people listening to this talk will be neurosurgeons and may not think about the AFOs and, and some of us as orthopedic surgeons may not train at trauma facilities. So knowing how important AFOs are at 
preventing pressure sores and pressure ulcers on the heels and preventing flexion contractures and getting the occupational therapist to design braces for the hands and fingers and wrist. And then something really interesting is my physician didn't prescribe a collar for me. And I always made my patients wear collars. And then halfway or partway through my recovery, I asked for a collar because spasms were pulling my neck to one side. But going a time without a collar and going a time with a trial of a collar, I can tell you that I'll probably re I rethink whether or not I would prescribe a hard collar in the post-operative period for my patients now. Uh, there's decent data to suggest that there's not that much benefit and more, some would say more harm with ulcers and pressure sores on the chin and the occiput, as well as the chest. So uh, that's something to think about. And then log rolling and air mattresses to prevent pressure sores uh, in the sacrum and ischial areas, something really important to think about. Another thing that I really learned in my recovery is that it's really important to praise your team. As a surgeon, I knew that I was the most important part of the team. And as a patient, I realized that although my surgeon was extremely important, I almost never saw him. And there are so many other people who are extremely important to the team in my recovery. The nurses, the CNAs, the respiratory therapists, and physical and occupational therapists, the speech therapists, all the other doctors taking care of me. And I also realized that I saw the cleaning personnel longer and more times than I saw my surgeon. I also realized and felt guilty about this that what, when I would go see my patients in the ICU intubated, I would look at them trying to talk to me and move their lips. And I would put up my hands almost, not figure, just not in reality, but in my mind, I would kind of look at them like this like, and say, well, when this tube is out, I'll talk to you and answer all of your questions. As a patient, that is so frustrating to have caregivers who can't understand you. And what might be helpful for you in the future is to bring someone who can read lips. Uh, maybe the nurse can, maybe one of your residents or, or fellows or PA can, but it's a tremendous benefit to have people who can read your lips when you're taking care of people who are intubated. And I'll go over a few moments of uh, what post-traumatic stress reactions or really terror that I had around autonomic dysreflexia, where my blood pressure went to 220 over 100. And I had a vent malfunction and I was trying to tell the respiratory therapist that my vent wasn't working and she couldn't read lips and she didn't understand me. So for between six and 10 minutes, she couldn't figure out that 
my battery would run out and that the tubing, there was something wrong with the tubing and being immobile and not being able to speak and drowning in saliva and not being able to ask for someone to come help you was terrifying or sitting up in bed for breakfast and then passing out from a syncopal event because patients that have high quadriplegia can't hold their blood pressures. And the multiple sterility breaches and the near dropping by a single person lift was all very terrifying for me. And the pain that I had around my trachea that was unexplainable. It was so severe. Um, I'll go into that, the first two, autonomic dysreflexia and, and trach pain in the next two slides. So autonomic dysreflexia is caused by irritation somewhere, somehow. And the number one cause is number one. So that's urinary. And number two, causes bowels. So if you think about going number one or number two, it's urinary or bowels. And so that's my physiatrist made that up one day rounding. And so if someone has sweating and high blood pressure, it's flushing, then the first thing to do is check their catheter and make sure there's no obstruction. And then the next thing to do is check and make sure they're not constipated. And then the next thing you can do is check for other irritants like in their skin. And you'll almost certainly be able to treat their autonomic dysreflexia and bring their blood pressure down from dangerous levels. And what I didn't know is that the C4 sensory distribution is in the shape of a knight's nape. And as you see right there at the junction of C3-4, that's exactly where my trach was. And that return of pain, which was dysesthetic pain, may have been the reason why I had such severe pain around my trachea or tracheostomy and why I still have some neuropathic pain around my shoulders. Another thing that I learned from my experience as a patient with functional dismemberment and chronic pain, pneumonia, benzodiazepine overdose, loss of bowel and bladder and sexual function, loss of independence, and a list of other things is what I refer to as the escape key. And the E stands for empathy. The S stands for sympathy. And the C stands for compassion. And although we can't teach empathy, sympathy, or compassion, I'm hopeful that hearing my story as a surgeon can help you empathize with your patients more and help you put yourself in their position. And in medical school, I was taught to not have sympathy and not say I'm sorry. And what I've learned based on adverse childhood experience research with trauma research is that it's okay to say that I'm sorry you experienced that or I'm sorry you're experiencing this and no one should ever have to experience this or should ever have had to experience what happened to you. And just saying those statements and asking if your patient would like to see someone helps improve their health. And 
that research is really important. So learning to say, I'm sorry you're experiencing that is sympathy. And I've learned is important for me to have for my patients. And to me, compassion is truly desiring that no one suffers. And having compassion for my patients is really helpful for me to give back to them. So empathy, sympathy, and compassion. And this helps me when I'm dealing with difficult patients. I can ask myself, what happened to you? Like in Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey's book, I don't have to be judgmental of them. I can do my best to have empathy and sympathy and compassion and know that their reaction is probably related to something that happened to them as a child or an adult. And this is something that I never gave my patients until I learned about hope and learn that hope is an option. I met these, all of these people, um, two of them before my accident. One was my patient and he's a surgeon and he was able to get back to the operating room. And he came to visit me and he gave me hope that I could return to the operating room. And the man in the middle is, he runs our orthopedic neurosurgery and PMNR department at the University of Texas. And he's driving and he's a C4-5 quad. And thankfully for me, I forgot that I was a C3-4 injury. And so I kept thinking that I would definitely be able to drive like him. And he gave me hope. And the man on the right came to visit me and he's a, a well-known lawyer in the Houston area. And he's a C3-4 quad. And he calls himself a, a real quad, not like all the other people out there because he doesn't move his arms or legs either. And here's some things I learned about advocating for my patients, our patients, and ourselves. And so this little curly cued device up at the top is a sip and puff uh, device that calls out to the nursing station. And when you can't move and you can't press the call button, and you can't talk, this was my lifeline. And being transferred to an ICU that didn't have one of these was frightening. And so this simple device can help your patients that don't have enough dexterity in their hands to push the call button. The device on the upper right is a sip and puff mouse. And it took me a year and a half to find out about this device. But when I did, I could access emails and call from my computer. I could make PowerPoints like the one I made. I could give you presentations without having to say, next slide. And this device really opened me back up to the world again. Not that being away from email and smartphones is the end of the world, but in a way it was kind of nice not to have access to that for six months, but some of it is helpful. And these devices on the bottom have really sophisticated voice control and when my friend bought me the Alexa, it was amazing. 
I could put the nursing station's phone number on it. I could call out there. I could call family and friends from it. I could listen to music. It was amazing. And the voice control application on the Apple device is really so sophisticated. Uh, I can check emails and message, message people and go through different apps. And it's not as easy as a, a mouse driven thing, but it's a miracle that it exists. And so teaching your patients about those different devices is really helpful. And then teaching them about the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation is something that I find would be really helpful for them. I didn't learn about the benefits of the organization until a year and a half after my injury. I knew I wanted to be a part of it, but I didn't know what they had to offer. And so offering quality of life grants to different not-for-profit organizations is one thing that they do. But offering a peer mentor program for caregivers and patients has been really helpful for me. So I could call someone and talk to someone with same gender, same level of injury, similar occupation, and talk to them about different things that help them. And caregivers can also talk to them. So having that program is amazing. The advocacy that they do it locally as well as nationally is amazing. And what's really amazing is the National Paralysis Resource Center, which is a government funded program that they are in charge of running. And there's so much information on it. And every time I check it, I'm surprised that I didn't know about it sooner. And so when you have a patient that has a spinal cord injury, I think it would be helpful to let them know about the Paralysis Resource Center, um, the peer mentor program, and for ourselves, uh, we can let others know about the Quality of Life Grants Program. And many of you may not know this, but when Christopher Ree was injured about 30 years ago, spinal cord injury research was, I would say, at the bottom of the rung. And finding a cure for spinal cord injury was not something that people really truly thought about. But I believe we're getting really a lot closer and closer to finding cures and definitely helping improve the care of people living with spinal cord injury. And this is an event coming up to increase spinal cord injury awareness. And it's something that we take care of all the time, but we don't promote awareness amongst our patients and our community. And the Reeve Run and Roll event, uh, which there's a link to, to my team, or you can form your own team, uh, but just getting people to participate in that and wear one of these t-shirts I think will help increase spinal cord injury awareness. And one of our colleagues, Yoon Ha, who's research on gene therapy for spinal cord injury is, I, I believe gonna be uh, instrumental in helping find a cure. He drew this image of depicting Christopher Reeve flying over the Reeve Foundation and it represents a brain mapping of Superman flying over the Reef Foundation. 
I believe that preventing spinal cord injury is the best way to cure spinal cord injury and promoting safe tackling and no diving unless you're a competitive diver or competitive swimmer and making sure that you're looking forward if you are riding your bike, especially in the neighborhood. And maybe we could get it to the point where we could emphasize uh, driving dry and without drinking uh, to help further prevent other spinal cord injuries. I'll briefly talk about ableism and my experience with that. And so when I got out of the hospital, I went to my apartment and I couldn't find the elevator to get up to my apartment. So I asked the apartment manager if she could show me where the elevator was. And she looked at me in disdain and pointed and said, it's over there. And I went and I looked and I couldn't find an elevator that worked. So I went back and I said that I couldn't find an elevator that worked. And she huffed and walked about 10 paces ahead of me and took me to an elevator that worked. And that was my first experience with ableism. And then one night I was lying in bed and my caregiver was standing over me and she said, I don't know why she stays with you, referring to my partner. I said, what do you mean? And she spread her arms over me and said, and just look at you. And then I still am confused as to why it took over 15 months for me to have talks of uh, getting a contract to return to work even after my doctor told me that it was okay to me for me to return to work 15 months before I was offered a contract. And here's a way to self-advocate for yourself. Many of you are have disability insurance through your company, and so did I. That was my primary plan. I had other plans which were occupation specific and paid through from post-tax dollars. And what I didn't know that if I did ever have to use my disability plan, if it's paid for from pre-tax dollars, then I get taxed on those benefits. And so my biggest plan that I have to live on is taxed. If all of my disability insurance was paid through with post-tax dollars, then I wouldn't be taxed on those benefits. And I could return to work as a non-operative surgeon and still not lose that benefit. But since my main plan was paid with post-tax, with pre-tax dollars, and it was not own occupation or occupation specific, 
when I do go back to work, I will lose that benefit and or have to pay uh, much of it back and I get taxed on it. And so that's something to consider if you can afford the own occupation with post-tax dollars with disability insurance. Having an accidental life and dismemberment plan was really helpful for me. And I didn't even remember this, but about six years before, I had signed up for a long-term care policy. And that's been really helpful for me in this period. And briefly, I'll talk about some of the research. Um, as we talked about earlier, early decompression, that work by Dr. Failings and others uh, to get EMS to respond aggressively and uh, have the institutions in the emergency room and operating room know that it's important to get our patients in as early as we can and keeping the mean arterial pressures around 85 if you can is really helpful to help optimize the likelihood of neurologic recovery. And then something that I'm interested to learn about is will really use all show a benefit. Uh, that data should be coming out soon and the results of that trial should be published soon. In terms of the chronic injury, functional electrical stimulation, either implanted or subcutaneous or transcutaneous, I mean, uh, is proving to be beneficial at least anecdotally and studies will soon show uh, how beneficial it is to the general population of patients with spinal cord injury. And then is there gonna be a role for neuroregeneration? We'll briefly talk about that. Here's the Reliazol uh, study is called the Riscus trial. I think it's completed now and the data should be out soon, uh, but that dose will be 100 milligrams twice a day, the first 24 hours, and then 50 milligrams twice a day for two weeks. The transcutaneous electrical stimulation is for upper extremity function, and the implantable electrical stimulator in the thoracic spine uh, will be to help mobility, um, standing, trunk control, and blood pressure issues. And these studies are ongoing now. And this is a paper by Dr. Failing's group. And I talked to him and he's convinced that stem cells from neural lineage combined with chondroitinase to break up the glial scar is going to prove to be beneficial to many patients with a chronic spinal cord injury. And so in conclusion, it was my tools for recovery that helped me stay present. And my experience as a patient that helped me learn more about empathy and sympathy and compassion and helps me learn to advocate for myself and my patients and you to help with the care of patients with spinal cord injury and hopefully find a cure and improve spinal cord injury awareness. And this is my email as well as a link to join my team or you can also form your own team to promote awareness for spinal cord injury. And thank you so much and 
if we can, I'll take questions. Wow, Dr. Marker, that was uh, fantastic. And my, I'm sure my colleagues have questions in the last few minutes here. So I'm gonna be, try to be quick with my comment and question. Um, so my first comment is, wow. My second comment is, thank you. Um, the, you know, as surgeons, I think we don't listen to other people very well. And um, hearing one of us, and not only one of us, but uh, a leader uh, uh, like yourself, go through this with the perspective you have is, is, is pretty sobering. And um, I can tell you after I heard you speak at Banff, um, you know, the idea where you talk about Asia A or Asia B and could, can, can you know, and I, we all have patients that say they think they feel something. And I guess I'm very, um, very hesitant to, to get rid of going right to the OR, right? I mean, I, I very much believe in, uh, like you said, early decompression and giving people the best chance and I'm very slow to call somebody in Asia A uh, in that regard. Um, you know, my, my, que my question for you is, as you reflect on your career to this point and um, kind of the path you took. I mean, it's amazing to hear your story and how your, your recovery was somewhat hinged on the tools you learned from, from things prior to that in your life. And so I guess my question is, you know, uh, when you look at your, your career till now, what are, what are things um, that you think of often that uh, not that you I don't want to say that you regret or you would do differently, but things you would, you would modify. I mean, you talked here, you know, about the financial stuff and things you would, but in terms of family, in terms of personal, in terms of career goals, you know, you, you have obviously more perspective than anyone in this room is going to have in that regard and a, and a kind of complete view of everything. So, so I'd love to hear you talk about that. And then I, I'm sure we have another question or two from, from my colleagues. Yes, that's a great question. One thing that, although I can't change it, I know I can't. One thing that I wish I knew was the fact that I didn't feel, like I couldn't actually name how I was feeling. That to me, I wish I knew was a sign that I might have issues with codependency. And the fact that I needed to please people was a telltale sign that I have codependency issues. Hmm. Not being able to feel or name how I'm feeling sad or afraid or happy or joyous or not being able to, wanting my kids to be tough boys, not, in, not going to them when they fell and were crying, not recognizing those cues or looking at people in teaching with shame and blame in the operating room. You know, I know your story wouldn't sound like I did that when we met, but maybe at that time I had mm -hmm. had some recovery. So I, I do remember that moment actually. Uh, and I think I said to myself, yet treat him kindly and I don't need to berate this person or shame this person and having those thoughts of knowing that I really couldn't name how I'm feeling and that 
I wanted my kids to be perfect and I wanted myself to be perfect. And when things weren't going my way, I would get upset at other people. You know, those things that I saw my mentors do and I wanted to emulate them because I thought they were better surgeons because of that and got better outcomes because of that. You know, if I had known that those are all issues of codependency, then I would have found treatment for my issues of trauma that I obviously had as a child in retrospect. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Matt, uh, I have a comment. And uh, Dr. Marco, I mean, I'm truly honored to, uh, you know, witness your talk live. I mean, um, I, I can't count the lessons I learned from, from, from your experience. And uh, your mission as an educator, which uh, continues until now. I mean, this this uh, you've, you've been educating uh, surgeons, and you continue to do that, um, and that's uh, um, uh, an honorable thing to do. And um, I just can't thank you enough. And you're a true true Superman. Uh, thank you. Well, Dr. Marco, thank you. Yeah, I can't uh, uh, I, I echo those sentiments, and I think we all do here. There's there's been uh, uh, even text messages coming into my phone while you're talking about about how amazing this is, and and uh, so so you know having a spinal cord injury sucks, um, and seeing you use your platform like this and influence like you have is, is pretty pretty amazing. Um, so so thank you again, and <clears throat> I look forward to. Uh, obviously more interactions with you and, and talking to you more in the future. Um, I think for uh, time's sake, we're probably about out. I don't know if there's a uh, uh, thought about what is coming up next week or if anyone needs to mention that. I think uh, Ali uh, left a message. So uh, J.V. Cummins uh, from MGH will be speaking about uh, variability in spine surgery practices next uh, next week. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks for everyone for being here. And Dr. Marco, uh, uh, thanks again for, for taking the time to, to do this with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's part of the plan, right? Absolutely. Love you guys. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, man. You too.